Nvidia's super refresh line of updated RTX 40 series graphics cards continues with the launch of the RTX 4070 Ti Super, an ungainly named arrival that seeks to replace its non-super counterpart, offering a range of upgrades, more memory bandwidth, a lot more, more CUDA cores, and 16 gigabytes of frame buffer memory, all for the same money as the outgoing non-super Ti. On paper, the specs look good, but in reality, Nvidia needs to strike a balance here. We can't expect the card to be within striking distance of the existing RTX 4080 because the specs suggest that 4080 Super won't be that much better. Push too hard on 4070 Ti Super and there'll be no market for the final entry in the Super Refresh. The specs do look good though, it's got to be said. 4070 Ti Super is based on the same AD103 silicon as the RDX 4080, automatically giving it an advantage over 4070 Ti Non Super, which used the lower performing AD104. Ti Super has 8488 CUDA cores, 10% more than its predecessor and 87% of the 4080's complement. Meanwhile, the new card even has a 100 MHz boost clock advantage over the 4080. AD103 silicon also means that the 70 series class gets a 256-bit memory bus, up from the 192-bit interface in the non-super predecessor, and an impressive 33% increase to overall bandwidth. And there's more. Not only uh, does AD103's 256-bit interface enable 16 gigs of memory, it means users get the improved media block with dual video encoders. AD104 on the non-super just got a single encoder. Now I actually use an RTX 4080 in my workstation for Adobe Premiere work and just a little gaming, so in this scenario I found that the 4070 Ti Super works just as well. Uh, for review today, we don't have the Founders Edition card because there isn't one, unfortunately. Similar to RTX 4070 Ti, Nvidia has handed this over to third-party board manufacturers to produce their own models. European Press were gifted the MSI Ventus 3X model, and I also received the ASUS Tough gaming version. The Ventus 3X arrives under spec though, requiring a vBIOS update. Without that update, the ASUS runs about half a percent to three percent faster, depending on the game, when both should be reference class boards. Both are large, relatively cheap looking cards that lack anything like the aesthetic refinement or the build quality of a founder's model. Their sheer bulk and size, enough to register on Dradis, does at least ensure very quiet operation and good temperature management. The 12 volt high power socket is back for power delivery, while it's the usual assortment of HDMI 2.1 and DisplayPort 1.4a video outputs on the rear of the MSI model. Uh, though curiously, um, the ASUS model rather helpfully gets an additional HDMI port. Testing in this review was performed using the ASUS Tough gaming version of the RTX 4070 Ti Super. But you know, the MSI Ventus with the vBIOS upgrade, pretty much the same. As usual, more games, more benchmarks and more resolutions can be found on my review at Eurogamer.net. Let's get straight to it. We may have AD103 silicon here, but do we actually get performance that's meaningfully different to the box standard 4070 Ti? Let's dig in by looking at ray tracing first and our old friend Dying Light 2. Everything starts well here with the 4070 Ti Super offering up a 12 point lead over RTX 3090, meaning we're at circa 3090 Ti level performance. An 8 percentage point lead over the 4070 Ti isn't exactly a game changing improvement however, and right away we can see that the kind of delta seen between 4070 and 4070 Super isn't going to be repeated here. There's a handy 23 percent lead over RX 7900 XT from AMD, but the RTX 4080, which uses the same base silicon, um, well that's a good 18 percentage points ahead. So 4070 Ti Super then, more Ti than 4080 on this one. Uh, Cyberpunk 2077, operating in pure RT mode here with no upscaling, offers us one of the bigger increases to overall performance. I'm seeing a 15 percentage point advantage here for 4070 Ti Super over the 3090, while we're looking at a 10 percentage point lead over the old RTX 4070 Ti. 
A creditable boost then, while the 43% lead over AMD's closest competitor, 7900 XT, is another plus point. The RTX 4080 is only 12 points clear on this one, uh, but that rises to 16% if you're gaming at 4K. Control Next, a game that has traditionally thumbed its nose at the Ada Lovelace generation of GPUs from Nvidia, offering substandard Gen on Gen gains over the Ampere 30 series cards, at least here in the corridor of Doom. But the 4070 Ti Super fares pretty well here with a 9 point lead over the mighty 3090, though this does drop to 6% at 4K. The wider memory interface may be making a difference here as even at 1440p resolution, 4070 Ti Super is 12.5% to the better against its non-Super counterpart. At both 1440p and 4K, 4080 is only like 14 to 15 percentage points clear, with a 23 to 25 point lead over 7900 XT. Depending on the resolution, this is clearly a much faster card than AMD's closest competitor, though that will likely change fundamentally uh, when you look at this without ray tracing enabled. Moving to Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition for a game's revised version of its excellent action-adventure shooter, well this remains the only AAA title that demands the use of a graphics card that allows for the use of hardware accelerated ray tracing, and until the new 4A Epic arrives it will always have a place in our benchmarking suite. RTX 4070 Ti Super humbles the 3090 here with a 14 to 17 point lead whether you're gaming at 1440p or 2160p. 4K. Pretty impressive I'd say. 4080's overall lead cut to around 14 to 16 percent so we'll be awaiting the RTX 4080 Super with much interest but a circa 8 percentage point increase in performance over the non-Super Ti won't exactly be putting it in the history books. So there's an interesting spread in performance terms and at best we're looking at a midway point between 4070 Ti and 4080 performance while at worst we're less than 10 percent better than the Ti which, you know, not exactly hugely compelling. That said, it does replace the TI at the same price and the extra RAM is clearly a boon. Now let's move on and take a look at rasterization where we should expect more challenges for the TI Super and a resurgence from AMD. Here we're looking at Forza Horizon 5 with RT disabled on extreme settings with native rendering for the best mixture of fine detail performance along with that signature 4X MSAA the game was designed for on consoles. And it's back to winning ways for the 4070 Ti Super to a certain extent. You got a 21 to 22% advantage over RTX 3090, uh, which isn't to be sniffed at, that should put it beyond 3090 Ti even. However, that's very much down to the Ada Lovelace architecture, so differentials against the outgoing 4070 Ti only amount to around 5-7% to overall, which is, you know, kind of unimpressive. That said, you'll note that 4080 is hardly a power player here with its own miserly wins against 4070 Ti Super, as low as just 5% better depending on resolution. 7900 XT does do well but doesn't come out on top. 4070 Ti Super is a good 13 to 14 percentage points clear. Prices have been cut there and I'd expect them to go down still further based on what I'm seeing here. Moving on, Hitman 3 is a highly performant game, well into the hundreds of frames per second at 1440p on so many of the cards I tested, but some data points are still worth mentioning. For example, it's an AMD friendly game once RT is factored out, meaning that RX 7900 XT is around 21% faster than TI Super at 1440p. The gap narrowing to quote unquote just 18% at native 4K. There is undeniably a class of games that is truly performant on AMD hardware, punching well above their weight. Uh, TI Super is outclassed there then, but with that said it is 13 to 15 points ahead of RTX 3090, so it's hardly a slouch. There are also some nice gains against 4070 Ti at 1440p. Um, somewhat in line with you know what I was seeing with raid facing performance in some titles. TI Super seems to fall somewhere in the middle between 4070 Ti and 4080 which is a state of affairs we wish was the case across all tested games. And next up a look at A Plague Tale Requiem. 4070 Ti has an 11 point advantage over RTX 3090 so again in 3090 Ti territory but that does drop to 7.5 points at native 4K. Against the Ada competition though we're back to 6 to 7 point leads over 4070 Ti 
while the 4080 is 18-19% ahead of the new Super. RX 7900 XT does very well here with a 10 to 14 percentage point advantage over the new Nvidia offering depending on whether you're looking at 1440p or 4k resolution. Finally Returnal up against last gen 3090 is beaten by a handy 10 points at 1440p otherwise it's uninspiring stuff a mere four point lead at 4k over the non-super 4070 ti and it's even worse when we look at 1440p amazingly enough and that is the worst delta found in this review you can barely tell ti and the ti super apart at both 1440p and 4K, I actually found the RTX 4080 to be a mammoth 24 percentage points clear. It's in a completely different class, which doesn't really make sense to me based on the specs. So look, the benchmark suite, yeah, it's getting on a bit now and will be refreshed this year. But I wanted to include coverage of other games, big ones that really put the hardware through their paces but are probably still being patched and not ready for full deployment in our benchmark suite. These games happen to be the top three best game graphics of 2023 as decided by Oliver, Alex and John. Cyberpunk 2077's RT Overdrive I'm testing here at 2160p DLSS performance, 1800p on the same DLSS level and 1440p DLSS balanced. 1800p is a custom set resolution that almost always looks great on a 4K screen and often offers significant performance advantage Advantages. So here 1800p is 30% more performant than 4K while 1440p on DLSS balanced is 53% faster than 4K. So look 67 FPS at 4K plays 87 FPS at 1800p plays 102 FPS at 1440p. This is all with frame generation on and in one of the most demanding areas of the original Cyberpunk game. 4070 Ti Super can definitely deliver a good experience on this one. Same thing with Alan Wake 2 here, though I have had to use optimized settings. I'm using the medium quality preset for rasterization, equivalent to the PS5's quality mode really, in combination with Alex's optimized settings for path tracing. Outdoor spaces, dense foliage, this is putting the engine through its paces and it's brutal stuff. 72 FPS at 4K DLSS performance mode with frame gen, playing 91 FPS at 1800p on the same settings a 27% boost with little hit to visual quality overall. Meanwhile, at 1440p we're getting a 52% performance boost over 4K and this time we've upped the DLSS quality level to its balanced mode. Average here 109 FPS. So yeah, again, this class of card can give you that top tier path traced experience. We just need to tweak the game as opposed to just whacking everything up to ultra. Some interesting results here in Avatar Frontiers of Pandora running on the high setting which is basically PS5's quality mode with a couple of settings pushed up a notch. There's no problem running this at 4K60 with DLSS balance mode for a 77fps average according to this run through the jungle but lowering that to 1800p once again increases frame rate significantly with a 38% boost that gives us an average just north of 100fps. For those on 1440p displays, we test here in DLSS quality mode and our performance level is now 59% higher than our 4K output with a 123fps average. Avatar is a simply stunning game, it scales remarkably well and so it's little surprise to see the 4070 Ti Super run this so well. Make sure you use the fixed scaling mode in the video options though. Initial results with the same resolutions tested but on the default biased scaling mode produce very very strange results as you can see here. Okay so let's wrap all of this up. There isn't quite the same level of excitement surrounding RTX 4070 Ti Super as there was with the 4070 Super. Looking at Nvidia's $599 offering, you got proportionately more CUDA cores and therefore a more comfortable and consistent rise to overall performance. The TI Super boosts specs in ways that would not always guarantee a consistent uptick in performance, so it seems to be the case that titles generally fall into two camps. Games where you get a relatively paltry 5 to 8% of additional performance over the outgoing 4070 Ti, and then there are other titles which increase performance to the tune of anything up to 15% over the non Super Ti. I wonder if what we're seeing here are games that are fundamentally compute limited, and then others where the extra 33% of memory bandwidth actually makes much more of an impact on the overall benchmark results we're seeing here. 
In summary then, 4070 Ti Super does what it needs to do at its price point and is likely more suited to 4K gaming than its predecessor, thanks to the extra memory bandwidth and the extra memory. It can't provide the kind of value boost the 4070 Super does, but then again we should expect more value from the lower end products. In looking at how the 4070 Ti Super compares to the more expensive RTX 4080, it's either considerably behind or at best sits at a kind of midway point between Ti non-Super and the 4080. It's a bit of an in-betweener product then. It's fine, does the job, comfortably ahead of 3090, can push ahead of 3090 Ti. But despite the AD103 silicon, it's clearly no 4080. As for 4080 Super, well, I guess we'll need to wait and see. Unless you're watching this in the future where you can find out right now. But in the meantime, that's everything from me. Um, like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for allegedly instant notifications when we quote unquote drop new videos. But of course, it's all about the DF Supporter Program, high quality video downloads of everything we do and everything we have done since late 2016, early access to DF Direct Weekly and other content, exclusive extras and a ton more besides. Oh yeah, and please do consider store.digitalfoundry.net for our high quality merchandising. That's all from me on this one. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.